In the mid to late 1600s, coffee arrives in London and almost immediately the city goes in insane for this uh, new beverage, despite the fact that every account of it describes how awful tasting it was. People really didn't figure out how to make coffee appetizing for about 250 years, apparently. And so coffee houses begin to explode across this, the city of London. And all of a sudden, all, all these people are spending lo long periods of time frittering away their day drinking coffee with their friends, men only, I should point out. Uh, the coffee houses were, were uh, male only for a very long time. And this becomes such a noticeable pattern that Charles II actually uh, issues a decree banning coffee houses from London because one, he believes that there are uh, kind of seditious conversation is happening in these coffee houses, which he might have been right about. But he also believes that basically they're a great waste of time. Uh, he has this line where he says that people are being distracted from their lawful calling and affairs. And so he issues this degree, bans coffee houses from London, and that ban lasts for one week uh, because people are like, we're not gonna give up our coffee. And what happens, in fact, over the next 100 years or so is that Charles II is exactly proved wrong. And in fact, what had seemed like a kind of an amusement or excessive leisure actually turned out to be exceptionally productive. The, the entire kind of flowering of the, of the British Enlightenment really was based in the coffeehouse culture of that period. So almost every important idea in science, in business, in, in politics has some roots in a, in a coffee house um, during that next century. And in 1754, I think it is, a group of guys get together in a coffee house in Covent Garden and start talking about how they can encourage certain advances and innovations that British society could uh, find useful. And that coffee house meeting is the birth of the RSA. So this very institution actually starts in a coffee house as well. And interestingly, the first two prizes they offer are for colors for dyes that could be used for um, blue ceramics and red dyes based on the matter plant, which up until that point were uh, largely limited to the low countries. So if you wanted to dye a garment turkey red, which was the very popular color at the time, you had to ship it out to Flanders and then bring it back. And so they wanted to encourage, in terms of agriculture, the, the, the development of this plant. So they created a prize, basically a reward for anyone who planted matter. And so right there you see the beginning of an institution kind of supported by this seemingly kind of idle pursuit of drinking coffee with a bunch of mates uh, at a coffee house, expending energy and money to try and cultivate something not particularly functional. There wasn't really you know, anything utilitarian about their color red. It was just delightful to look at. That interest and, and ingenuity directed towards things that are initially amusing or playful or delightful that story repeats itself throughout human history. One of the prime movers of historical change is in fact that appetite for delight and for play and for amusement. If you think about the kind of model of historical change that most of us learned when we were in grade school or college, you know, what are the prime movers that really drive history? You think about nationalism, you think about religious identity, you think about the quest for power, you think about scientific advances. I think there is also an argument. There is this very human desire for delight and for play, and that often those initial explorations, seemingly frivolous, will lead to much more momentous changes down the line, like the institution we're sitting in today. Another play space, even older than the, the coffee house, which is the tavern, the bar, uh, the pub. Maybe the first space devoted exclusively to an escape from the normal world, escape from home, escape from church, escape from the workplace, um, a space where you would go, uh, spend some time with some friends, uh, have a little alcohol, and uh, the whole entire environment was de devoted to that experience. The history of these spaces has been incredibly important, particularly for the history of politics. Very often new social relationships, new ways of interacting, new ways of being public in, in society first take root in these wonderland spaces of, of bars and pubs. Just think in modern life about the importance of bars to the history of the gay rights movement. Uh, Stonewall Tavern, the Black Cat, um, where a lot of these early protests happened in, in the United States. Something about a, a bar creates an environment where people are willing to experiment with new identities that they're not necessarily willing to present in a wider public context. And so new ways of interacting with other human beings become possible in these spaces once they've been carved out and, and defined. 
And of course, in the, in the American system, you cannot tell the story of the American Revolution without talking about the network of taverns, in, particularly in New England. Just as the coffee house was central to the British Enlightenment, uh, the tavern was central to the American Revolution. It was the hub where all these ideas uh, of rebellion really first took root. It was an important communications network. It was where the Declaration of Independence was read aloud. It was where texts like Common Sense were read aloud. It's probably likely that the American Revolution would have happened had taverns never been invented. For the revolution to have happened without taverns, another mechanism for social gathering and for the sharing of ideas would have had to have been invented. It would have required a different information network, a different social network. And so you have momentous political changes coming out of spaces that look like, in Charles II's words, a space to escape your lawful calling and affairs, but they actually end up changing the, the affairs of the, the world. When the British soldiers arrived to put down this, unsuccessfully put down this rebellion. The red coats they were famously wearing were dyed red with the matter plant that had been grown successfully on British soils because right at, at 1775, the RSA had concluded that its premium that it had, it had announced to support the indigenous growth of matter was successful and there was enough red dye in the British colonies, I mean, in actual, within the shores of, of England itself, that they no longer needed to artificially encourage its growth. And so their red coats were actually dyed with locally grown red dye, thanks to the coffee house interventions of the RSA.